The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, teach thy people to love thy house best of all dwellings, thy scriptures best of all books, thy sacraments best of all gifts, the communion of saints best of all company, and that we may as one family and in one place give thanks and adore thy glory. Help us to keep always thy day, the first of days, holy unto thee, our maker, our resurrection, and our life. God blessed forever. Amen. All right, well, welcome back. We are in John chapter 5. We have, for the past several weeks, been looking at this miracle that Jesus performed at the pool of Bethesda, where there was a lame man that Jesus healed. And we noted that the section ended on a very ominous note. It ended uh, with the Jewish religious leaders seeking to kill Jesus. And a lot of this had to do with the fact that Jesus' understanding of how the Sabbath was to be observed differed from that of the Jewish religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. Well, we're going to carry on with the study of this section today and take a look at the rest of the chapter. So if you have your Bibles, please open them to John chapter 5. We're going to begin at verse 18, and we're going to go ahead and read through the rest of this section. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. The father judges no one, but he has given all judgment to the son, that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has also granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not deemed true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. 
for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Well, as I said, the Jewish religious leaders by this point in John's gospel, it seems relatively early in John's gospel, but again, as I reminded you last week, fully half of the fourth gospel, fully half is given over to just the last week of Jesus' life. So even though Jesus walked this earth for about 33 years, and even though he ministered for three of those years actively, really you'll notice that the gospel give a disproportionate amount of time and effort and energy to the last seven days of Jesus' life, that period between Palm Sunday and Easter. And that's because that's really the focus of Jesus' ministry. And you see that especially here in the Gospel of John. So much of Jesus' three-year ministry is really compressed. So it seems early on in his ministry here in John chapter 5 that the people are beginning to turn on Jesus. But it's probably further along in his ministry than we would imagine. But the point is that the huge crowds that have been following Jesus up there in Galilee, those crowds that numbered well into the thousands, when Jesus went to Jerusalem, he became a very controversial figure. And many of those crowds began to dissipate, and the Jewish religious leaders in particular have turned hard against Jesus. It's no longer a case where they are simply interested in discrediting him, which is what they wanted to do, ask him all of those inane questions that were designed to trip him up. At this point... What they want to do is to destroy Jesus. They want to wipe him off the face of the earth. And the main reason is because he was making himself equal with God. Sabbath breaking was a serious offense. There's no doubt about that. But making yourself equal with God, well, that was another matter altogether. That was blasphemy. And according to the Jewish law, it was punishable by Death, And that's exactly what they are seeking for Jesus. They are seeking to destroy him. Now, if Jesus had been a madman, if Jesus had just sort of been one of those individuals who was slightly off mentally, the Jewish religious leaders would have simply shrugged their shoulders and ignored him. And we all know that there are people like that that are mentally unbalanced and make all kinds of extraordinary claims, and we don't hold them accountable for what they say. Well, that was not the case with Jesus. Jesus didn't strike anybody as an insane man. He was perfectly sane. What's more, what really irritated the scribes and the Pharisees is that when Jesus spoke, it was like E.F. Hutton. Remember those old E.F. Hutton commercials? When E.F. Hutton talks, what? People listen. Well, that's the way it was with Jesus. Jesus spoke as one having authority. The scribes and the Pharisees had a derived authority. But Jesus spoke on his own authority. People listened to him. They were drawn to him like a moth to the flame. And this really irritated the scribes and the Pharisees because the reality is Jesus was not officially licensed to do this sort of thing. He was not an official preacher or teacher. He hadn't gone to college. He hadn't gone to a rabbinical academy. He hadn't been licensed by the Sanhedrin to say the things that he was saying. He was just saying it. And the problem was the people were going over to him and leaving the scribes and the Pharisees, the one who were supposed to have authority. And so they were angry, they were jealous, and they wanted nothing more than to destroy Well, Jesus made some extraordinary claims. There's no doubt about it. C.S. Lewis is helpful at this particular point. I'm going to read you a couple of quotes from Lewis. Uh, They're rather lengthy, but I think they make the point very well. This is from God in the Dock. Lewis said this about Jesus and his claims. He said, on the one side, you have clear, definite moral teaching." On the other, you have claims which, if they are not true, are those of a megalomaniac, compared with whom Hitler was the most sane and humble of men. There is no halfway house, and there is no parallel in other religions. If you had gone to Buddha and asked him, are you the son of Brahma, he would have said, my son, you are still in the veil of illusion. If you had gone to Socrates and asked, are you Zeus, he would have laughed at you. If you had gone to Muhammad and asked, are you Allah, he would first have rent his clothes and then cut off your head. (laughs) If you had asked Confucius, are you heaven, I think he probably would have replied, remarks which are not in accordance with nature are in bad taste. 
The idea of a great moral teacher saying what Christ said is out of the question. In my opinion, the only person who can say that sort of thing is either God or a complete lunatic suffering from that form of delusion which undermines the whole mind of man. If you think you are a poached egg when you are looking for a piece of toast to suit you, you may be sane. But if you think you are God, there is no chance for you. We may note in passing that Jesus was never regarded as a mere moral teacher. He did not produce that effect on any of the people who actually met him. He produced mainly three effects, hatred, terror, adoration. There was no trace of people expressing mild approval. Now that's an apt description of the attitude of the scribes and the Pharisees right there. He is not an insane man. There's nothing about him that would in, insinuate that he was insane. And what made matters even worse was not just the claims that Jesus made, but the works that he performed, the signs that he performed that seemed to back up his claims. Remember just two chapters earlier in this same gospel, it was Nicodemus who came by night, a member of the Sanhedrin, a member of the scribes and the Pharisees, and what does he say to Jesus? We know that you are a man who has come from God, for no one could do the things that you are doing unless God were with him. So understand, they did not believe that Jesus was a madman. This is not somebody who's delusional who's making these claims. Here's what else C.S. Lewis has to say. This comes from mere Christianity. He said, Jesus told people that their sins were forgiven, but that makes sense only if he really was the God whose laws are broken and whose love is wounded in every sin. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. And you hear this all the time. Namely, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing you must not say. For a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he never intended to. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees understood that very well. Lewis calls this the great trilemma, that Jesus is either who he claims to be, or he is a liar, or he is a lunatic. And the odd thing is he didn't strike anybody as a lunatic. So he either was an extraordinary liar who deceived thousands of people, and one might say billions of people, or he was who he claims to be. And that means that you and I need to pay close attention to the claims of Jesus Christ. We need to pay close attention, if for no other reason than billions of people, right down to the present day, claim to know Jesus Christ. They don't merely claim to know about Jesus Christ in the same way that we know about Julius Caesar or Catherine the Great or Woodrow Wilson. Billions of people down through the centuries right to the present day. Many people sitting here in this room, including the one who is speaking to you today, claim to know Jesus Christ personally, to have daily fellowship, communion with him, to talk to him and to hear him speak to them. And it's not just the simple-minded folk, either, like the one who's speaking to you. <laughs> it's brilliant people down through the centuries. Those of you who are coming to the Mere Anglicanism Conference, you're going to hear some of the most brilliant people in the world. The keynote speaker is the Andreas Idrios Professor of Science and Religion at Oxford. He holds three, count them, three doctoral degrees from the University of Oxford, all of them with first-class honors. Brilliant people who nevertheless claim to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
and who say that they have found life in his name. Now, there's no other religion in the world that makes that kind of a claim. So we cannot ignore the claims of Jesus Christ. You cannot shove him off into a corner. You need to pay close attention to what he says, and you have to come to your own decision as to whether or not these claims are the claims of a liar, the claims of a lunatic, or the claims of the Lord of glory. But Lewis is right. Folks, there's no middle ground. There's no halfway house. Jesus' claims are of such a nature that a decision is forced upon us. That's precisely the question that Jesus asked his disciples on one occasion when he went up to Capernaum. They were walking along the road near Capernaum one day, and Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I am? And everybody had a response. Oh, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some say you're Moses, some say you're one of the prophets, all these different answers. But then Jesus got very serious and he looked at them and he said, but who do you say that I am? That's exactly what he's asking you this morning. Who do you say that I am? I'm not particularly interested in what the culture says. I want to know what you think about me. Who do you say that I am? Well, what I want to do today is to take a look at some of the claims of Jesus. And as we do, I want you to evaluate them for yourself. Ask yourself the question, who do I say he is? And if you answer, as Peter did on that occasion, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God, then ask yourself, now what does that mean for my life? What are the implications of that for me on a day-to-day -day basis if he really is who he claimed to be? But first, we need to consider the claims of Jesus Christ. And we need to do that for a number of reasons. Not only because so many people claim to have fellowship with him, but because if they are true, they answer some of the fundamental questions of life. The questions that you and I are constantly wrestling with. The claims of Jesus tell us whether or not there really is a God. Or whether or not you and I are just flotsam floating about in the midst of a meaningless universe. The claims of Jesus Christ, if they are true, teach us that there's not only a God, but this God has spoken. As Francis Schaeffer once said, he is there and he is not silent. That he spoke in the past and speaks today. And finally, it tells us that we can have life. That this world, mixed with good and bad, happiness and sadness, is not all there is. It tells us that we can know God, whom to know is life everlasting. So the claims of Jesus are the most important claims and how you respond to them are the most important decisions you will ever make, ever, in your life, about anything because they have eternal consequences. So what are the claims of Jesus? Well, he makes a number of them here. I find it very interesting. We're told that they were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, a wise person, at least from a worldly point of view, would have been quiet at this point. Don't say anything else. You've said enough. But instead, Jesus goes on to make even more extraordinary claims. There is a sense in which Jesus, by what he says in the verses that follow, verses 19 and following, seals his own fate. So what does he say? Well, the first thing he says is that, yes, he and the Father are one. They are one, and moreover, he says, they are at work together in the world. Look at verse 19. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, whenever you see that, the old King James used to say, verily, verily. So those of you who like the old version, verily, verily, truly, truly, it means sit up, pay attention. 
It was a rhetorical device often used by the rabbis in the first century. But whenever you encounter it in the scripture, it means just that. Sit up, take notice. You're accusing me of being equal with God, making myself with equal with God? Well, sit up and take notice. Truly, truly, verily, verily, I say to you that the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Now, that claim had implications in two ways. First of all, we've already said that the scribes and the Pharisees acknowledged the fact that Jesus was a worker of wonders. How could that be? How, how could he do the things that he does? Here was this man at the pool of Bethesda who'd been lame for, for 30 years or more. And, and here he was, never able to be healed, never able to get into the water. Nobody could do anything for him. And lo and behold, Jesus comes along and by the sheer power of his word, heals this man. And there were plenty of other examples. There was the example of the woman who cried the chronic bleeding disorder. Do you remember her? We're told, I think this is a sad commentary on medicine in the first century, but they said she suffered for many years under the care of doctors. <laughs> I suppose there's a reason why we say we practice medicine. They've been practicing on her for a long time. I object. <laughs> I have no doubt that you do. <laughs> but she reached out in faith and touched the hem of Jesus' cloak and immediately she was healed. Lepers were cleansed. The lame found the ability to walk. The blind received their sight. And on at least three occasions, as we're going to see in just a moment, Jesus raised people from the dead. And nobody denied it. I love the third occasion where Jesus raises somebody from the dead. John chapter 11, it's the raising of Lazarus from the dead. It's the most impressive of all these miracles. And it was a public miracle. Most of the time when Jesus did something like that, he did it in quiet and private because he didn't want people to put all the focus on the miracle and miss the man and his message. But John chapter 11, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and there were lots of people who saw it. That sets the stage, incidentally, for Palm Sunday. That's why the crowds that had dissipated are suddenly back because Jesus had performed this great miracle. But the scribes and the Pharisees were so frustrated by that that they said, the scripture says, they conspired to kill Lazarus. Now Lazarus had already died. Jesus brought him back. We're going to kill him again. I mean, it's almost humorous when you think about it. So nobody denied the fact that Jesus performed miracles. The question was, how in the world did he find the ability to do this? Where did the power come from? Now, initially, they had to admit it must come from God. And that's what Jesus is claiming here. He says, you know that. Now, later on, what they're going to accuse him of is, no, it can't come from God. We can't say it comes from God, because if it comes from God, then we have to acknowledge him. We're not prepared to do that. We hate him. We want him out of the scene. And so they claim that it came from the devil. Oh, he casts out demons, but he does it because he has a demon within him. He casts Beelzebul out because he has Beelzebul in him. How did Jesus respond? Those famous words, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. So the first claim that Jesus makes is that, yes, he and the Father are one. Furthermore, he and the Father work together. Whatever he is doing is in accord with what the Father does. Now that had powerful implications, if you think about it, in terms of the Sabbath. Because their whole complaint against Jesus was that he was not honoring the Sabbath or observing the Sabbath the way that they said you had to observe the Sabbath. Instead, he comes along and says, you've got it all wrong. The Sabbath was not made, or man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was what? Made for man. He took their whole idea and turned it on their head. And what he is saying is, not only am I teaching this, but I'm teaching this because what I teach is in accord with what God teaches. Now, that's probably not the way to make friends and influence people. But nevertheless, that's what Jesus says. And what this teaches us is that Jesus is more than, just, C.S. Lewis says, just a great moral teacher. He's not just a great prophet. Now, that's what people will tell you today. Jesus still remains the most admired person in the world, even people who are non-Christians. Mahatma Gandhi, for example, 
extolled the example of Jesus Christ. There are Muslims who acknowledge or at least say that Jesus is a great prophet. He is still an admired individual, but that's as far as they are willing to go. How many of you have seen all of these folks standing around town? They're up um, down by um, Washington Park. Um, you can see them up near um, Marion Square. Uh, they're all over the place. And free Bible course. You seen those people? You know who they are? They're the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses are nice people, but they do not believe, let me explain this to you, they'll call themselves Christians, but they do not believe that Jesus is equal with the Father. They would put Jesus on the same level of an angel. He is a created being, but he is not God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made. Well, there are many people like the Jehovah's Witnesses who are willing to put Jesus in that camp. He's a great man. He may be the greatest of all prophets, the greatest of all moral teachers, but they are not willing to say that he is Almighty God. But that is the claim that Jesus makes here. And that is the claim that you and I have to wrestle with. We have to go much deeper than the world is willing to go. Dr. James Boyce uh, once told a story of how after college, uh, he and a college buddy took a trip around the world, and one of the places that they went was to Luxor, Egypt. And he said they went there to see the ruins. Uh, he had majored in the classics at Harvard University, and he was going to go on to get his theological degree and eventually get his doctorate in Tübingen, Germany. But in the meantime, uh, between all of this schooling, he was going around the world with some friends, and they went to Luxor. Now, if you've been to Luxor, it's a magnificent site, um, great excavations there. And they were looking around, and they saw this huge pillar that was, I don't know, 40 feet in the air or something like that. And on the top of it was a small little hut. And they couldn't understand how in the world this little hut, that was obviously not from the same time period, ended up on the top of that pillar. How did that happen? And so they asked one of the guides, and they said, well, before the excavations, um, the sand had filled in this area, covered the whole region. And this man was a Bedouin, and he was part of a Bedouin community, and he'd come, and he was looking for a place to build his little hut, and he built on what he thought was solid rock. And what he was really building on was a prior civilization. And so he built his little hut, and then what happened is, as time went by, um, sandstorms would come, the sand would shift, and he realized that, lo and behold, it wasn't bedrock at all. This was a former structure. And then eventually what happens is that this place becomes discovered in the 20th century. Archaeologists come in, they begin to excavate the area. He is forced to leave the area, and they begin to dig around the pillar, and what they discover is that there's much more down there than they had thought and by the time they finish, this little hut is way up there on the top of this pillar. Well, I want to suggest to you that is exactly what we are called to do with Jesus Christ. If you look at him just as an historical figure, just as a prophet, you have missed what is really much deeper than that. You must dig around, and what you will discover is that he claims to be so much more. So that's the first claim of Jesus Christ, that he and the Father work together. Verse 20 also implies that he is in perfect accord with the Father. He is doing what the Father does, and the way he understands and interprets the Scripture is the Father's will. In other words, this is the true, true interpretation. He goes on to say not only that he and the Father won, not only do they work together, but here's another claim that he makes in verse 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Here's another claim of Jesus. Not only am I one with the Father, not only do I understand the Father's real purpose and will, but just as the Father is the one who gives life, so the Son is the one who gives life. Now, listen, that really would have rubbed 
the Jews the wrong way. There's a wonderful story in the Old Testament, we're going to turn to it in just a moment, that accentuates this point. So if you will, keep your finger there in John and turn to the Old Testament to 2 Kings chapter 5. Now, this is a story about one of God's great prophets and about a Syrian general who had contracted leprosy. 2 Kings chapter 5. Syrian general is named Naaman. Now the story is rather lengthy. We're not going to read the whole thing, just the first part of it. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. You understand that the Syrians are the enemies of Israel. So he's a Syrian general, he's a great master, he has favor with his king, he's a very powerful, influential person. But it goes on to say, he was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now leprosy in the ancient world was a serious illness. It's sad, we can deal with it by antibiotics today. That was not the case in antiquity. Uh, it was a debilitating disease, it attacked the body's nervous system, um, you would break out in sores all over your body. Eventually what would happen is appendages would simply die and drop off. It was a terrible disease. It was death literally by a thousand cuts. So this was a great man, but now he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mystery, would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. In other words, there was a man in Israel who had the ability to heal people. That's what they believed. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, thus and so the girl spoke from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, excuse me, yes. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. So you got the story, here's this man, powerful um, Syrian general, he's a great man, very accomplished, won great many victories for his lord, the king of Syria, but he contracts leprosy, this debilitating disease that makes him an outcast. The king of Syria doesn't want to lose him, and he's heard that there is somebody in Israel who can heal his general, and so he sends all of these gifts to the king of Israel so that the king of Israel may heal him. And what I want you to notice is the response of the king of Israel. It's in verse 7. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is looking to make a quarrel with me. Now what's the king of Israel saying? He's putting me in a terrible position. I'm not God. I can't give life to somebody. I can't cure somebody. He acknowledges that only God has that kind of ability. Well, what is Jesus saying there in John chapter 5? He's saying that the Father, that's true, only the Father has the ability to do that. And yet Jesus is saying, look at the works. I do have the ability to cleanse lepers. I do have the ability to open the eyes of the blind. Interestingly enough, this is a well-documented fact even from secular history. There are secular sources that acknowledge the fact that there was a Jewish itinerant rabbi in the first century who led a messianic movement. His name was Jesus, Yeshua, and secular sources say, this is in Roman sources, he was a man who performed mighty deeds. 
So what is Jesus saying? He's saying, if you don't want to believe for my words, believe for the sake of the words, the works themselves. Look at what I'm doing. The proof, as it were, is in the pudding. He has a claim to give life, and he'd done it on more than one occasion. It wasn't just healing people. As we said, he raised at least three people from the dead. There was Jairus' daughter. There was the widow of Nain's son. And there was Lazarus. And it's interesting, they come in that order in the Gospels, and each one of those stories gets more dramatic than the one before. In the case of Jairus' daughter, we're told that a synagogue ruler came to Jesus in desperation because his little daughter was sick. And he said, will you come with me? And Jesus says, I'll come with you. Jesus begins to make the journey with the man. But on the way, they encounter that woman that I mentioned earlier who had that chronic bleeding disorder. And she reached out and touched Jesus. It's a very dramatic scene. We're told that the crowds were pressing in on every side. And this woman thinking, if I could just touch the hem of his cloak, I'll be healed. And so she reaches out and she touches the hem of his cloak. We're told that Jesus felt the healing power going out of him. And he turned around and he said, who touched me? Now, if you want to get an idea of what that would have been like, imagine the market in the height of tourist season. And Jesus is making his way through the crowd. You know what it's like down there. It's just wall-to-wall people. You're trying to make your way through all of those stalls, and all of a sudden, somebody, just imagine this in the present day, if somebody shouts out at the top of their lungs, Who touched me? Everybody would panic. And that's exactly the scene here. Who touched me? And the disciples are very upset about this. Like, Shut up, quiet. What are you saying? Who touched you? Everybody touched you. But Jesus knew that somebody had touched him in a different way. Somebody had touched him in faith. He felt the healing power go out of him. Now, while all of this is taking place, Jairus is over there, anxious, because I was here first. I asked for your help first. Don't worry about this woman. Let's get on. So when they finally get moving again, we're told that servants come from Jairus' house and said, forget it. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Your little girl's dead. And Jesus takes him by the arm and he says, don't worry, just believe. By the time they get to the house, the mourners are already there. We have professional musicians, they have professional mourners in those days. And the people are wailing and making much ado. Jesus puts all the people out of the house. He takes the girl's parents and a couple of his disciples and they go into the upper room. Little girl was there. She's just passed. For all we know, the body hasn't even cooled yet. Jesus takes her by the hand and he says, Talitha Kume, little girl, I say to you, get up. And all of a sudden, the eyelids began to flutter. The heart began to beat. And the little girl sat up. And Jesus said, give her something to eat. And then he says, now don't tell anybody about it. (laughs) And they told everybody about it. (laughs) That's pretty dramatic. But the little girl had just died. You might say, well, maybe she wasn't completely dead yet. Second example, though, is far more dramatic. It's in Luke chapter 7. Jesus, we're told, came to the small village of Nain. And as he approached the town, there was a funeral procession making its way out through the gate. Jews in the first century, when you died, they tried to bury you as quickly as possible, especially if the Sabbath was approaching you would actually be buried on the day that you died. So everybody would come in. It would be certified that you were dead. They're having the funeral procession. This is the service, folks. They're making their way out, and Jesus sees this woman, this widow. She has no way of caring for herself, and this was her only son. In the first century, this was the way that she would have survived. Her children would have taken care of her. And now her only son is gone and Jesus has compassion he goes up to the funeral cortege he has them stop and he touches the body and the boy sits up and we're told that everybody was filled with fear well let me tell you something I would have been 
I've been to many funerals, but if anybody ever sits up in the casket, I'm going to just tell you right now. I'm out of there. So that's more dramatic than the first time. The third time is the most dramatic. Lazarus has died. By the time that Jesus arrives in the village of Bethany, Lazarus has already been buried. Service is over. He's been buried. Furthermore, he's been in the grave for about four days. Jesus says, roll away the stone. And Martha, ever practical, says no. The body's already started to decompose. The old King James puts it well. It says, he stinketh. (laughs) That's what it says. You can read it. He stinketh. It's one of my favorite places to go in the Holy Land. You go to Bethany, and the tomb of Lazarus is there. It's, it's a wonderful place to visit. Now, the guys don't want to take you there because you've got to go to the West Bank, and you've got to go through all the checkpoints and all that sort of thing, but I love to go there. There is the tomb of Lazarus. It is there. There's a first century house next door, which many believe was the home of Mary and Martha. It's been preserved from the earliest days. But the tomb front is all bricked up. So if you want to access the tomb, you have to walk up a hill, a street, and there's an opening at the top, and then you walk down about 40 stairs down into the bowels of this hill, and you crawl through. If you're claustrophobic, you aren't going to like this. But if you have to crawl through this space, and all of a sudden you open up into this cavernous room, and you are where the miracle took place. It's like you are there with Lazarus in the tomb. Now, outside, there's this beautiful church, and it is covered with mosaics on the inside. Splendid church. But it shows the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And it shows this man. You see Jesus calling him out. You see Mary and Martha there in the mosaic. You see the dead man coming out, dressed like a mummy, because he was wrapped up. That's how they wrapped him in the first century. The Egyptians weren't the only ones. Jews did this as well. He's all wrapped up, and you see one man, I love this, holding his nose and pointing at Lazarus. Body had already started to decompose. And Jesus prays to the Father. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. And we're told the dead man came out and Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. Now, who can do that? And as I said, it was dramatic because there were many people, we're told, who had come out from Jerusalem. Bethany's only about five miles from Jerusalem. Who come out from Jerusalem to comfort the sisters in the loss of their brother. So Jesus claims to be one with the Father. He claims to interpret the Father's will and word perfectly. He claims to be the one who alone can give life. And it's not just physical life, it's spiritual life. That's one of the things that I pointed out, that billions of people over the centuries have claimed that in coming to know Jesus Christ, they have found true meaning and purpose for their life. They're not simply willing to live for him if necessary. There have been millions of people who have been willing to die for him. Where does that come from? Finally, he says, find it there, that he claims to be able to render judgment. That is to say, how you regard Jesus Christ will determine where you spend eternity. How you regard Jesus Christ is where you will determine where you spend eternity. It's one of the things that we say in the creed. We don't think about it much, but we say it, and it's true. We believe that he will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. The scripture said, it is appointed man once to die, and then there's judgment. There's no, I want you to hear me very clearly here. You're not going to like this, but I can't help it. There's no second chance after death. The decisions you make in this life in regard to Jesus Christ, will determine where you spend your eternal destiny. Now that is what Jesus Christ is claiming. That's why the scribes and the Pharisees were so bent out of the frame. 
He claimed to be one with God, to fulfill the Father's will, to interpret the Father's word. He claimed to be the one who gives life, without which you are spiritually dead in your trespasses and in your sins. And he is the one to whom all judgment has been delegated. And so here's the question you've got to ask yourself. How do you regard him? What do you make of his claims? Jesus puts before you today, and if you've never really thought about it, never really considered it, you need to do so. Who do you say I am? That's what he's asking. Am I a liar? You can't say he's a great moral teacher if he claimed to be God and he was not. Is he a lunatic? Is he a demon? Or is he exactly who he claimed to be? Jesus' claims are such that you cannot remain indifferent about him. You cannot shove him to the back of your mind you're going to have to wrestle with who he is, who his claims are, what his claims are. And you're going to have to wrestle with the fact that billions of people, even today, claim to know him, to know him personally. And you can too. Now next week, we do not have class. Well, we have class, we won't have this class. We're having a guest speaker, one of the mere Anglicanism speakers is going to be with us next week. Dr. Michael Ward, he is probably the world's foremost authority on C.S. Lewis. So I'm going to have to give a volume to Brian McGreevy when he comes next week. <laughs> He's going to be our speaker next week. But when we come back the following week, we're going to pick up here. And I want to return in particular to this idea of Jesus Christ being the Lord and giver of life. And I want to talk about what it means for Jesus Christ to give us life. Not just in the future when we die, but what it means for Christ to give us life here. What does that life look like? What does it involve? What difference does it make? We'll take a look at that in two weeks' time. Let us pray. Father, we cannot avoid Jesus Christ. We either have to face him in this life, or it is certain we shall face him in the next. He made extraordinary claims. Help us to wrestle with those. Lord, we are wonderful at distraction, of, of distracting ourselves from the things that really matter, from the questions that we really need to wrestle with. But these are the most important questions that we will ever wrestle with. The question as to who Jesus is and what he came to do and what that means for our lives as individuals. If there be any here today who have never wrestled with this, who have never considered these things, I pray, Lord, that you will give them no rest until they have done so, until they have settled in their minds and their hearts as to who Jesus Christ is that in coming to know him, they may come to know everlasting life. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.